I give myself to find you, stumble and fall to see you, you're worth it all, to me you are. I swim across the stormy seas, scream it from the mountain peaks, you're worth it all, and to me you are. And I said, hey, you're the one that I've been looking for and I found you here yes I found you here I said hey you're the one that I've been looking for and I found you here yes I found you here and thinking back on all the time I passed by with blinded eyes I thought that I would be just fine and dripping over all my lights so you there with no disguise and you're worth it all and to me you are and I said hey you're the one that I've been looking for and I found you here Yes, I found you here. I said, hey, you're the one Jesus that I've been looking for. And I found you here. Yes, I found you here. Do you see my celebration for this open invitation to your arm? Your arm. Well, it's a beautiful fixation as I find myself surrounded by your love, your love. I said, hey, you're the one that I've been looking for and I found you here yes I found you here I said hey you're the one Jesus that I've been looking for and I found you here yes I found you here everybody doing this morning? Good. Uh, I got, I'm ready to rock and roll, I guess. Sorry, I got a little carried away. couldn't be happier that you were able to make it today. If you've been here before, we just want to say welcome back. However, if it's your first time joining us, we just want to welcome you to our Sunrise community. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us to draw near to God and He'll draw near to us. All of you made a choice this morning to wake up, get out of bed, get dressed and come here. That's a great first step in drawing near to God. We will be worshiping with music for a few more songs before the sermon gets started. So please, feel free to use this time to turn off your phones and use the restroom. Be sure and stop by our common coffee for a snack and fellowship time. Get settled in and see what the Holy Spirit has in store for you today. If you have any questions about today's service, please see one of the pastoral staff, the deacons, or the person who invited you. Thanks again for fellowshipping with us this morning.
right, how's everybody doing? Sorry about my, uh, I got a little rammy on there. I, I, I outpaced the, uh, the clock there, so. And I don't know if you guys can tell the difference, but my ears just popped. I feel like I'm sitting in 10 feet of water right now, so if it sounds bad, blame, uh, blame Kim. <laughs> <laughs> She's carrying the voice today. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing, yeah Holy God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. It's the earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we see Everyone sing, yeah Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. And it's rising up all around to see it come up. The Lord's renowned, and it's rising up all around to see it come up. The Lord's renowned. Together we see. So everyone. Sing, yeah. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Yes, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. Is filled with His glory. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? It's so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Yeah, yeah Whoa, Jesus is sinful 
all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, Jesus, sing for all that you've done for me. Yeah, yeah. All that you've done for me. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Conquers the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquers the grave. Sing, worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquers the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Yeah, yeah. All that you've done for me. Praise the Lord, He is good, isn't He? Lord, you are good to us, so much better than we ever deserve. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord God, the maker of all heavens, all the earth, and all the sky. We humble ourselves in the presence of a holy and mighty God. You truly are a God of wonders. We submit ourselves to you this morning, Lord God. First Chronicles, chapter 29, David prays a prayer as he gets ready to... Uh, inaugurate his son and he says this yours O Lord is the greatness the power and the glory the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom O Lord and you have exalted as head over all both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Can I get an amen to that? Lord of all creation, water, earth, and sky, Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. 
holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the light. When I stumble in the darkness, Lord, I will call your name by night. God wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. Lord, you are holy. Lord of heaven and earth. If you've got a prayer request this morning, why don't you come on down? Pastor, we really love the opportunity to pray with you this morning before the Lord of heaven and earth. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and God wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. And precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, God of wonders, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, and the universe declares your majesty, you are holy, holy, Lord, you are holy, holy. Jesus is holy, holy, and hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord.
God, you are holy and your ways are righteous and just.
then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Oh God, you are great and greatly to be praised. We lift all that we are to you this morning, all of our cares, all of our burdens, everything that we have that weighs us down, we cast it aside in favor for the God of glory, him who created all things. We worship you in this place this morning. You are truly great and greatly to be praised. Have your way amongst us this morning, we ask. recently and I know I do that a lot actually and I, I was reading about somebody who is a missionary and they work with special special needs people who have either mental some type of mental disability or physical disability and I, I was reading something that was really encouraging first of all the, the main point of the article isn't what I'm going to read I'm reading an excerpt of how they got into ministry the main point was talking about how God miraculously healed him. And in the time he was under a medically induced coma with COVID-19, literally God let him peer and see and hear when heaven, all the prayers going up on his behalf. And to the point that he said it was like God gave a mic to the prayer of his wife and she could, he could literally hear word for word what she was praying and she wasn't even in the room. And when he came out and was better well enough that they could see each other, he said, I heard you pray this, and she's like, you broke down crying. She's like, that was word for word what he said. I was like, I know. God, let me hear you. Like, it wasn't like shocking. It was just amazing how God does that. But that's, that's awesome. But the part I want to encourage us with is, yes, our prayers matter. But even further, I, I'm a big fan and believe strongly in God anoints and equips us for ministry, all of us. And this is what they said. They went and saw what God was doing in these camps and different places. And we saw young people with mental and physical disabilities filled with the Spirit. Or we would say baptized in the Holy Spirit would be another phrase you might recognize. When you see someone with Down syndrome speaking in other tongues and another one give the interpretation that is spot on, it really changes your outlook. I want to encourage you this morning, whatever God's calling you to, whether you feel equipped or well enough or good enough. It's not about you, our limitations. We all have our limitations. It doesn't matter if it's some type of genetically defined thing or it's our own personality limitations. But God wants to anoint and equip you to minister. Whatever gifts those might be, obviously I'm going to talk about giving here in a second, but whether your giving is like the woman that widow with two mites, and Jesus said, despite the massive gifts these people with a lot of money give, she gave more than all of them because out of her need she gave all that she had. Now, I'm not saying that thus saith the Lord, give everything in your checking account today. I don't know what God's speaking to you. I'm just saying don't look at the size or limitations you have. God's looking at your faithfulness, and that's what God wants to see in our hearts. It's a relationship. So with that, if you want to give today, there's three ways you can do that. One, you can use the offering envelopes in the pews in front of you, and you can put it in the box by those double doors. You can get on our app or our website and click the Donate tab. Or if you want to text to give, you can text SUNRISE to 77977 and follow those prompts.
And I want to pray over that. And then I have a few things I want to talk about. And just, I was, God is so good. I mean, I mean, we just sang to him. And just take a second. Let's just go before the Lord one more time if we can. Lord, I thank you, first of all, that you are great, worthy to be praised. You don't have to meet with us. You don't even have to live in us yet. You choose to dwell amongst those you love. You invite us into this loving relationship, whether it is coming to church and worshiping you out of, res- out of response of love and not just obligation, whether it's giving out of a response of love and just knowing it is a, a privilege and an honor to be a part of what you're doing here in the city and around the world. Dad, we just recognize that everything we have comes from you. And Lord, so we, like the widow with the two mites, like these young men and women who, despite their limitations, we just surrender our heart to you and just ask you, Lord, to speak to us. We surrender what we have to you, and we just want to be obedient in love and honor. I ask you to bless back each person who has just faithfully given, even if today they feel like, what good was this? It's so little. Or they look at it and they're like, I feel like I'm giving a lot. And that they would just see no matter what the check amount, the cash amount, whatever it is, Lord, that they would just see that it is a faithful honor and response to you. And that you would bless them back immensely for their faithfulness because that's just the God that you are. You're so generous and loving to us. We thank you for these things. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. If you want to give them a round of applause. Well, if you are a guest here with us today, I am so glad that you're joining us. Thank you for spending a few hours here Sunday morning on a cold, rainy day. I say that because in a minute I'm going to talk about something going on today for the youth group. But if you could just take a minute to fill out a get-to-know-you card sitting in the pew in front of you, we want to say thanks for being here. We'd like to get to know you a little bit. we also like to share a little bit about who we are as a church. Because coming on a couple Sundays doesn't fully reflect that. You don't get to see and hear all the wonderful things. You know, it, it, you get little snippets. But this is an amazing church, and I think um, most people who have been here for a while can say this really is a family. And you can put that in the box by the double doors when you're done filling it out. Or if you want to see me in the hallway afterwards, I'd love to have a chance to meet you and say hello. Now, with that, that family treatment, I want to real quick say thank you to everybody who sacrificed part of your Saturday yesterday to come out and help us move. Janet, that was amazing, awesome. She was very blessed by that, was very thankful. Most of you, I'm sure you heard it a couple times. If you did not hear it, I know she had mentioned it so many times to us that she was thankful for the help. I personally just real quick have to share a quick memory besides the fact that I feel like Jeff and I got stuck like every time we came down, they had like the heaviest things waiting for us. I'm like, I'm noticing a trend here, Jeff. I'm like, I don't know why. I'm like, maybe we need to go on a union strike. No. And then, of course, we end up lifting a couch over a balcony to go through a sliding glass door. So if you're on Facebook, check it out. Kim, thanks for recording that uh, and posting it. I'm like, thankfully, we don't look like amateurs that didn't know what we're doing. We look like we actually had a plan and it worked. So it came out looking good. So thank you to everybody. Uh, Just a couple quick things I want to go through that won't be on a video. First of all, Youth, if you're planning on going to the cider mill today, that's 6th to 12th graders. As of now, it's not raining. It's just cold, wet. So we're still going to go in the corn maze, and uh, I'm sure going to follow all the rules and do everything proper. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, after service, we're bringing in McDonald's. We'll eat here, and then we'll head over to Spicer's. Uh, next Sunday is the annual business meeting. The information is in here I'm just flying through it real fast. You can read it. Please come hang out. Even if you're not a member and can't vote, at least come hear what's going on because it's really important to recognize that this church isn't just stuck. We are literally continuing to seek God and move forward and press into what's next for us the next season. So there's some cool changes that we're looking at that's going to be presented there. And then the other thing you probably saw in your bulletin that I want to draw your attention to is a little survey. This is for those who have been here for a long time. You know we do a Thanksgiving dinner every year. If you're new, you've never been here in November. Every year we have a group coming called Life Challenge, Teen Challenge, they, whatever name they're going with today, it's Life Challenge. But they, it, it is an amazing time of hearing testimonies of what God's doing in people's lives. And then afterwards, that Sunday, we have a big dinner. We're just trying with all the 
craziness in this world right now with COVID coming, going, and surging and fading. We just want to know where comfort levels are. We're trying to accommodate. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you could just literally take a few seconds and fill that out, I'm actually literally just, this will be the easiest way. If you can literally just grab a pen out of your pew and take a, like 30 seconds, are you comfortable with no matter what? You're not comfortable at all, or if there's social distancing, because we do have limited facilities, we're trying to gauge. So if you could just take a minute and fill that out. If you don't have one, just stare at me awkwardly and grab one when you leave. And as you're doing that, again, it's three, it's one, just comfortable, no matter what, comfortable if there is social distancing. I will never come because I don't like your cooking. <laughs> but I'm not cooking, so that's a poor reason, but. And then when you're done, you can literally just, after church, don't throw it away. Just after church, just throw it on the Welcome Center. I'll go out there and collect those from you. As you're finishing up, as I, unless you're me and a perfectionist and you really are thinking through, you're checking your calendar, you're like, everything I need to know, possibly, um, let me just take a second as you're finishing that up. And I just want to say, we're going to have a presentation here for a second. So if, Amy, you can come up and... Yeah, you guys can give her a round of applause. I mean, she does a lot here, so just to add to it, come on up on stage. Everybody wants to see you and hear you. So if you guys can just give a minute, this is pretty cool. Good morning. All right, speaking of COVID, it seems like we have been in this COVID business for months. So I don't know, most of you might remember I stood up here several months ago pre-COVID and I asked you guys for help with two things. The first thing, and I, I had um, spoken to Erin, and I said, what's something that your dad would want? And she said, for my sister to be able to fly home from Alaska, because the tickets are very costly. So I'm like, okay, so I presented that to you guys. I gave that gift to Erin by hand to give to Kathy. So I just wanted to let you know. The other thing, that I asked you guys was if we could bless Pastor and Diane with something very, very specific, something that you've been talking about, and a few of us have overheard you in passing, that you have a desire, you and Diane, to take another trip. And so you guys have been amazing. The outpouring has been amazing, and I wanna thank you. But we are believing in faith and standing in agreement with you that you and Diane are going to get to go on that trip. So this is for you. And we love you guys. But thank you. You guys have been incredible. Thank you, thank you. So, hello. Okay, so we're not done. We're not done. Awesome. If I could have Pastor Jeff, Pastor Brian, Pastor Doug, and I don't see uh, Aaron and Danny of here aren't here, of course, right? If you guys can come up here, Pastor Brian, did you escape? Oh, okay, go on up here. Uh, we're gonna keep the appreciation going. Uh, on behalf of the board and the congregation of Sunrise Church, um, we just want to give you guys a little bit of a token of our appreciation. Uh, we're just blessed that you guys have continued to bless us, like as Amy said, through these months of turmoil. Uh, the church is, we haven't missed a beat, which is good. We are continuing to worship, uh, and that's uh, indicative of your, your dedication to um, our church and our ministries, right? So um, here you want to pass those out. That's for Pastor Jeff. And you can take Diane's as well. And we have one for Pastor Brian and Pastor Doug. And then I'll, I'll, we'll have to get Pastor Danny. And, and we have one for Aaron as well. Amen. Uh, Aaron stepped up as uh, we wanted to recognize Aaron as well because she stepped up, uh, filled you know Diane's shoes over the last uh, 
year uh, is a great job because it's pretty big shoes to fill. Uh, Diane, uh, and so we wanted to make sure we were blessed by that. Did you guys want to say anything? Yeah. 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 I just I just wanted to point out that yesterday these three guys were helping, right? So not only are they leading, but they're leading by example, and that's just amazing. So somebody in our congregation needed help, and they were there. They're there all the time, always a great example. So I just appreciate them. I will. Can I say something? Please. Can you guys stay up there with too? Can you turn that mic down? I want to. I just want to acknowledge that uh, you know you're talking about everybody should use their giftings and that God's moving everybody. I had a guy text me this morning saying the same thing. You shouldn't judge anybody, whatever else. So, and this is not bragging, but because of good leadership in my life as a young man, uh, my life's not real disciplined. I, I'm, a, I, I'm all over the place. But one thing I always do uh, is have time with the Lord in the morning. Amen. And uh, so I'm reading about Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel this morning. I'm reading about a bunch of different stuff. I go from Old Testament, New Testament, whatever. And uh, a lot of times I don't understand the word, but this morning it's like I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5, and I believe God confirms things with us all the time if we're willing. And I said to my wife, you know, this morning uh, I was reading 1 Thessalonians 5, and here's what it says amongst other things that I got personally convicted of, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> and now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who worked so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. And, uh, I, you know, Pastor Jeff and all of you up there, uh, we do love you. Yeah. And appreciate it. And how you press through hard times, at least for me, is a far greater testimony than when we're all walking in great victories. And, uh, Amen. you know, on Sundays, when you keep preaching about faith and believing, and you keep leading this congregation uh, through all the stuff we're going through. You're worthy of our appreciation and overwhelming love. And uh, Amen. thank you so much, all of you, uh, for what you do for this congregation and this community. You have a huge footprint in this community. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. It's different now. Uh, it was actually a lot of fun uh, watching them put the couch up over me. You know, over the, I'm glad they weren't on the third floor. I'm not exactly sure what we would have done. But, but the, the folks were amazing how quick they did everything. You got it, man. You, this, this dude right here, he's amazing. Joe, you did a fantastic job, too. I mean, you all did. But wow, the skills, the abilities, thank you for all that with Jan. I know that uh, she was blessed. And I saw Kim out there, you know, pounding away. She was as tough as the guys, getting it done. I love all that, getting it done, fantastic. Thank you for all of you and what you did. Um, I want you to look around you this morning. The room is filled with places to sit. Is that a really profound statement? All right, we start profound, we get better, right? I mean, that makes sense, right? You're here. How many of you would love to stand for church? 
Okay, a couple of you say, I am totally into that. Now, one, I remember when you were on the board a long time ago and you were trying to move for stand-up board meetings. Keep them short, keep them cogent, keep them simple. I un- and I understand that. And maybe my board now would be like, actually, that sounds pretty good. I, I mean, you can keep things tight. But I mean, we kind of expect, right, to spend a little time in church. There's going to be some music. There's going to be some talking. And, you know, if you had to stand every Sunday for 90 minutes... I'm not going to ask you, I'm just going to make a guess that if you had to stand for 90 minutes every Sunday, people would start finding reasons to be elsewhere, right? It would be, some of you are going, no, but I'm guessing humans being humans, that might kind of hit. And yet we do stand in line sometimes. How many of you have ever gone to Cedar Point? How many of you have ever waited for two and a half hours in line for a ride that lasts 90 seconds? You know, and you just can't wait for it. And you're there and it's 9,000 degrees and you're sweating and they're blowing water mist on you. And, and, you know, you've got your 75 ounce Coke and whatever, but but you're trying to make it through so you can ride that 90 second ride. Or how many of you have gone to the DMV lately? (laughs) Now the word is make an appointment and show up then, right? Because back in the back of the day, you could wait forever. I think I literally did wait two and a half hours one time because they stupidly went in without an appointment. And you just get bounced back and everybody Uh else takes over, you know, at one time. It's crazy. So we do spend time sometimes sitting, waiting, or standing in line. Now my point this morning isn't talking about places that we stand or are willing to. It's simply to say that we prefer to sit. Sitting is easier. Since we listen a lot. Is my mic off? Is my battery dying? It it just did. All right. There's there's a pack of batteries. Yeah. All right. I love high tech stuff. How many of you have uh, watched Napoleon Dynamite? Oh, I love technology. Oh. <laughs> my, my homage to Kip. There you go. Thank you, Kate. Hey, we got an RV. All right. Good deal. Thank you. It's amazing. You have people that are so good at what they do. That's fantastic. So, so how many of you know that it's easier to take notes? If you do that, it's easier to take notes if you're sitting down. You don't have to stand there and try to do it on your leg. You know, I mean, it, that's, it, it's easier. <coughs> Our feet get less tired, so we have seats. In fact, I'm going to say, considering how long God's people have been sitting in churches across the last two millennia, we've invented our own type of seating. Pews. I'm not here to preach about pews or against them. It has nothing to do with it. It's just how many of you know that these are, this is church seating right here. You see pews anywhere else? Maybe, maybe you see them in some kind of restored historical building. Maybe you see them in an old train station, if it's a historical train station, something like that. But how many of you know this is pretty much a church thing, right? Uh Uh-oh, he's preaching against pews. No, I'm not. I already said I wasn't. I'm just saying that they are, we're, we're so good at sitting down sometimes. We've developed, we've engineered our own solution. Now, I remember being a kid. I know that's hard to believe. But I remember being a kid and thinking that I would have to sit in church forever. There were some long services back then. How many of you have ever been in a long church service? I mean, I'm not talking about 90 minutes, 100 minutes. I'm talking about several hours. Yeah, those pastors would talk forever. The worship team would sing forever. And when they were done, they'd have an altar call. I mean, I I worked for a pastor for seven years, and his idea of an altar call was 45 minutes, in which he would re-preach the sermon he just preached during the altar call. It was kind of deadly. I mean, I mean, he was a great guy. He loved Jesus. I'm not knocking that, but it's like, dude, you already said it once. You don't have to say it twice. You know, let's just get to the bread part. How many of you as kids think, I mean, would you hurry up, Pastor Jeff, because there's Dairy Queen and there's the restaurant and there's things to do. And I'm not picking on kids because sometimes as adults, we in the same boat. I understand that. Now, thankfully, I eventually realized what those adults found so fascinating. And back then, we did it Sunday morning 
And Sunday night, we came back and we did it again. And Sunday night was usually longer than Sunday morning. So I mean, as a kid, it was just like, give up Sunday. You're just going to be in church all day long. But eventually, I found out what they found so fascinating that made me a little bit more able to sit and wait and watch. Not everybody does. Many people begin to assume that sitting and waiting is the biggest part of faith. People out there in the world go and they make things happen, but we wait on God. People go and make a life. We wait for eternal life. People go and have fun, but we put it off or call it sin and just wait for heaven. Maybe that's an overstatement, but there are some people in the church that kind of think that's what it's about. Have you ever met one? We got saved, and we're waiting to see what God's going to do next. Something somewhere will happen. And I think, honestly, that's one reason why so many people begin to fade out in their walk of faith. I think it's one reason why some young people, many young people, just check out, right? They go into an active, busy world that's saying, we're going to make stuff happen. And we tend to think it's all going to happen later. We have our ticket. We got saved. It's right here. We're holding on to it. Someday we'll cash it in. We'll get on the train and we'll go. Except that waiting gets boring. The pew is hard. Our butts are sore. Surely there's got to be something out there that is more exciting. And it becomes easy, doesn't it, to sometimes start chasing other things. We chase work, we chase school, we chase ideas, relationships, plans, fun. Out there it's happening. Here we sit. Is that what God wanted us to do? And I know somebody's going to say, you're going to remember, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. See, it's in there. It's biblical. Yes, it is. How many of you know there are times you need to wait? There are times you need to stop pushing ahead in your own strength and your own ideas and you need to chill and you do need to see what God's leading, where he's leading you and what he's doing in you. I agree. But if you look at the scripture for that one wait and a few other waits, there's a whole lot of goes. Yes, Israel was told to stand and see the salvation of the Lord, but when the salvation of the Lord happened and the water split, did God say, camp there? How many of you know he said, go through? Now, I don't know about you. Was there a risk involved in that? Water doesn't usually stand in walls. Now, you and I, right, we can go to the big aquariums, and there are those big plexiglass or Lexan over there, and we can walk through the tunnel and go, ooh, fish. But how many of you would stand there so quietly and confidently if cracks started to form in the Lexan? How many of you would be out of there like so fast? You're like, I, I do not want to get hit by all this water. I am out of here. Okay, so now imagine being Israel, and there's no window. There's no Lexan. There's no nothing. And, and God says, walk through. Go. Can I get a second opinion? I mean, I realize there's Egyptians. Slavery, drowned in the water. Which one am I going to do? They went. They moved. Once they got on the other side, they didn't camp there either. They moved out. There are a lot of times in scriptures where God's people are told to go, to do, to act. And we're given the power to act and the instruction as to how to act when we get there. God did not, in general, intend this to be a sitting, waiting, pew-dwelling kind of life. And by the way, you say, oh man, he's really hitting us today. And we were so nice to him a minute ago. No, I'm not. Chill out. I'm not mad at anybody. We have a great context, and context is king. We had an awesome group help somebody move yesterday. We've had people be faithful of this and faithful. You guys have done awesome work. I'm not knocking you, not in the least. I'm just saying, if you look around and you ever feel sometimes like, maybe this is a little slow, maybe, maybe life is more exciting elsewhere, that's not God's fault. God has called us to, to go, to do, to act, and he's given the power for us to live a full, exciting, productive life. And I want to look, I want to kind of show up a lot of what I've been talking lately about moving in faith and belief rather than unbelief and stepping out in the authority of Jesus Christ, and I want to wrap it into one final package. First of all, one of the goes he tells us to do, he says, go physically. I find it interesting just how much sitting, waiting, and patience God's people are advised to do and show today. How many of you know that um, in most of the world, Christianity, at least they know it exists? 
You could be in the Middle East. I understand. We have a missionary in, uh, and I'm not supposed to say anything that is on the internet. We have missionaries in areas of the world where it is illegal to be a missionary. Right? Whether we're talking somewhere in China or the Middle East or wherever else. They, they go there and they can't have their missionary, their, their card on, their, their tag. Because if they would, they'd be thrown in prison, they'd be deported, whatever. Sometimes it's very dangerous. But how many of you know that in most countries of the world, they have some idea of what Christianity is? Doesn't mean they have it all right, doesn't mean they haven't been told lies, but it's not like unheard of in a lot of places in the world. So, I mean, the church is kind of around, it's pretty much everywhere. And in some places like the United States, it's, I, I don't know if I want to call it the majority religion anymore, because a lot of people say they is, but they ain't. How many of you know I'm not trying to judge, I'm just observing? How many of you know saying you're a Christian doesn't necessarily make you one any more than saying you're a McDonald's hamburger makes you one? Just means you're confused about your identification, that's all. Okay. Now, the fact of the matter is here that, that in the world, so many places Christianity is known. But imagine being a Christian back in the beginning. How many Christians are there in the beginning? Jesus ascends to heaven. How many are there? Well, 120 that we know of, absolutely the inner, inner core. You're, you're totally right. No, but maybe a few hundred. You know, some that weren't absolutely hardcore inner circles. Maybe a few hundred. And most of those are concentrated where? In Jerusalem, which is a city of tens of thousands of Jewish individuals that have really no clear idea of what's going on with these Christians yet and mostly don't like them. I mean, it's kind of an awkward place to be. And if you step out into the empire, you start finding that there are, we're talking a tiny handful of Christians here or there. Now, what seems safer to you? To move when Christianity is a known quantity in most of the planet? Or to move when you are one of few and nobody's not exactly sure what you are and when they find out they don't like you. They call you a heretic. They say that you follow a criminal. Because Jesus was crucified, right? By judicial act. So by Roman law and Sanhedrin law, he was considered a criminal. Ooh. To say that you hate humanity... Has that ever been said since? Imagine moving then. Wouldn't it have been nice if God would have said, okay, little baby Christians, just stay here. Stay undercover. Stay safe. Wait until you're stronger and better and more numerous and then go. And yet, that's not how Jesus works. First scripture, Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Luke 9, 1 and 2 says... Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now imagine for a second, Jesus knows that the religious leaders don't like him. He understands that. He's already had pushback. The disciples, frankly, know that the Pharisees don't like, the Sadducees don't like their master. Nobody's really clueless here. And yet Jesus does not say hide. He says Go. And if I'm going to ask you to go, I'm not going to ask you to tough it out on your own. I'm not going to ask you to be slicker and better speakers than everybody. I don't want you to argue people into the kingdom. I want you to show the authority and power of the king who reigns. Maybe I need to say that again. He wants you to show the glory and power and authority of the king who reigns. And so he empowers them, and he says, listen, you can handle diseases, you can handle exorcisms, go get them, man. I have given you the power and the authority to do. Now imagine the first time the disciples go out, or the apostles go out, if you want to say that, because now they are sent ones, and they have to do the things that God has empowered them to do. Imagine Thomas getting to cast out a demon. We jokingly call him Doubting Thomas. How many of you realize he wasn't hopeless his entire life? 
you know, the guy has one bad day, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's known as Doubting Thomas for the next 2,000 years, right? I mean, he was an apostle. He, they said he went to India and he died, you know, you know, sharing the gospel in the Indian subcontinent. You know, he was somebody who followed Jesus. Imagine the first time that this guy has to cast out a demon. The first time James sees a crippled leg healed. Imagine Paul accomplishing both at the same time. Imagine being there. And I realize Paul is later. I get it. No, don't, don't tell me that I forgot that because I know. <laughs> but at the same time, right, imagine stepping out. Anybody here ever prayed and watched somebody's body get healed? Anybody here ever prayed and watched somebody's body get healed right now? How cool is that? Anybody ever walked in and prayed for a dead guy and they got up? How many of you know that happens? That happens. But we don't think about that, do we? I mean, I mind pretty well when I walk into funeral homes. I hope you see the humor in that. <laughs> right? I mean, you talk about ruining business. You know, you start walking into funeral homes and you start believing God and somebody sits up. I mean, you know, they'd probably ask you not to come back. You'd, you'd be knocking their business. It wouldn't be good. You're supposed to stay dead. That's when we process you. Now, we're laughing, and, and maybe a little uncomfortably, but, but wait a second. Isn't this the God who delivered the demoniac? Isn't this the God who raised the dead? Isn't this the God who restored sight to the blind? Yeah. God sent his people out. To do this now, some of it, somebody's going to say probably, "Hey, wait a second, Pastor. Don't. Wh what are you aiming this at, at any of us for?" Jesus was talking to the disciples. He wasn't talking to me. Come on, you say that context is king, Pastor, and in context, he's talking to disciples. Well, let me give you a clue. How many of you realize that Jesus didn't say anything to you in the pages of Scripture? Think about that. If you want to be context worthy, and did Jesus ever say, "And I'm giving you eternal life"? Didn't use your name, did you? Did he? Did he ever call Jeff to do anything? Do you see the name Jeff in there? Doug, did he ever say, I'm going to make you totally whole, Doug? So how many of you realize that none of us get our name inserted into the book, and yet all of the promises that God made to his people are yours? So I'm not messing up the context or messing up the hermeneutics here. God Jesus Christ, walking in the world, made promises to empower you. And he told you to go out there and show that and walk that out. Now, I said this on Wednesday, and I, and I have to preface it. We all come from different places, spiritually. I understand that. You come from probably 10, 20 different denominations at least. And there's all different understandings that we've had packed into our head. So if I say something that offends you, I give you three words. Get over it. If you want to contest me, you contest me. You want to come into my office, call me account, please do. I'm happy to talk to you. But unless you prove it otherwise, get over it. So here we go. If you're here and you've ever been taught dispensationalism, $10 college word, you've been taught wrong. Dispensationalism says that God has an expiration date on certain things. That he only heals so long. That he only raises the dead for so long. That tongues only lasted for so long. That somehow there's a, there's a date in there and at that point that gift, that action, that miraculous power gets blown away because it's expired and it's not there anymore. And they'll try to tell you something about, you know, gifts. You know, look in 1 Corinthians 13, and someday these things will be done. How many of you know that 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about when you're standing in heaven before God? Is there any point in talking in tongues when you're in heaven before God? Does anybody need to be raised from the dead when you're in heaven before God? Does anybody need their leg healed when they're in heaven before God? No. So yes, the expiration date is when you get there. Until you get there, dispensationalism is wrong it's wrong so the same jesus who made promises of his power his enabling abilities to be vested in your life and then commanded you to go is still operating by those same rules now and he said in mark 16 15 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus called on us to be spiritually active. After the resurrection, this command will continue to echo through the church. Imagine being the disciples again. And there's maybe 120 of you, and there's only a few leaders. And those leaders are locked up in Acts chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 5, 19 to 21, we see, But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. Now, if you'd been in prison for your faith, how many of you think the next thing would be to hide undercover? I mean, come on, be serious. You don't want to go back. And yet the Lord said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and they taught. So you've been thrown in jail and then you show up to preach in court. How many of you know you're going to make it easy for them to find you again? Talk about simple. Go into the enemy headquarters. That's exactly what they do. They're filled with the power of God. These are not sitters. These are not waiters. These are not people relying on human power. It's way over that. A while later, you see Paul. Now, this is a, this is a reference, reference back to the past. But Acts chapter 22, verses 10 to 11. Paul says, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go to Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. The very beginning, Paul is, you know, he's an abuser, he's a a, a tormentor of Christians, he gets smacked off his donkey, he's turned blind, and the first time he looks up and goes, okay, what do you want? (laughs) Yeah, Lord, he finally puts that in there. Look what God says immediately. Go, do. Go, do. Never wait. Go, do. God tells us to go, and some of the going is physical. And it does call on our resources. It does involve risks. But God promises from the beginning to tell us what we need to know. God's going to answer the questions. He's going to make sure that the power exists. Whether your culture loves you or hates you, he is there to help you do what he's given you. I'm glad a couple of people got excited about that. How many would like it if God told you to do something impossible and just said, tough it out? Tough it out? That'd be lousy, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, seriously. And yet he doesn't. Now, so often we struggle with the command to go, whatever it means for us personally, because we feel unready. How many of you ever feel unready? I'm not sure I know how to answer all the questions. I, what happens if somebody asks me that? And, and you know, I have, a, I have a past. Anybody here have a past, or did you arrive this morning on the world? <laughs> you have a past, right? And they go, well, we know you. We know what you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and you're older like me a lot longer ago. We know who you were back then. We don't argue with the reason to go. We understand that God so loved the world. We understand the need to go. There's a lot of broken people out there. We just don't feel like we're going to be good at it yet. Someday we might learn enough. Someday we might have the arguments down. Someday we might have overcome our fear or stopped failing when dealing with that annoying temptation. Someday we might understand God's better. But right now, it seems easier to sit. Here's where Luke 9, 1 to 2, which I started with, kicks in. Do you think the disciples were really ready to go out into the world and share the message? Have you looked at the disciples again? I mean, were they brilliant theologians? Fishermen. Now, there's nothing wrong with fishermen, and I have fished with some amazing people. Intelligent people. Fun people. But I'm just saying, these folks were not skilled practiced debaters. They were not movers of crowds. And yet Jesus said, I empower you. Go out and get it done. They had doubts. We have doubts. Folks, I understand that we don't have everything mastered. No matter. We're called to do something, but it was never about us. We're the link, not the source. We're the ones called to walk in the power of God just like the disciples did back then. 
so often we confuse that empowerment with pretty words or capable arguments. God, I'll go when I know more. We dumb it all down. Jesus did not train moral elites. Jesus did not train perfect paragons that showed everybody how it was done. That would be performance-based. He simply told real people to go. He told us to follow him in holiness, but he doesn't say you don't have to go until you master holiness. Anybody here mastered holiness yet? <laughs> Anybody here have a few problems with holiness? I do. I'll raise my hand first. Yeah, right? We're, we're human. And yet we're not marking time until we get it right. We're sent in his power. Now, let me give you another scripture. 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to write it down if you don't turn there. I want you to be able to go see it later, look at it in context. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. says, And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? How many of you know that not everybody has all the gifts? God doesn't say when you get all of them, which by the way, if you add all the gifts list together, there's something like, depending on how you count them and split them, maybe 21 or 22 gifts on the three or four lists in Scripture that talk about them. Anybody here got them all? How many of you are still sitting there saying, I'm not quite sure I got one? Okay, in all fairness, right? I mean, that doesn't mean you can make us not a Christian or that we don't love God. Or it's just sometimes we look at our life and say, I do not feel particularly gifted. You know, okay, that's just a matter of looking because God has gifted all of us, just not with everything. Now, I think what happens is, is we want to jump immediately to the last sentence in this passage, the end of verse 31. And yet I will show you a more excellent way. How many of you know that's going to launch into the whole discussion of love? And love is not love in, like, Hallmark Channel. We're not talking about romantic love, <laughs> gushy and sweet. Place for that, I understand. We're not talking about, you know, sexual love and interest. We're talking about working with people that you don't always like. We're talking about giving to people who don't always seem to deserve it. We're talking about taking risks for people that don't seem worth the risk. And continue. How many of you know that is varsity level, grown up love? That ain't easy. In fact, if we're really honest, most of the time we know we should do it. And you and I, me too, struggle to do it. We don't do it consistently. We might do it great for that person, not so great for this one. Love at that level is hard. But I said we tend to skip a particular sentence between do all interpret and yet I show you a more excellent way is but earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, Kurt, if I give you a laptop, what do you get? Uh, a, <laughs> a laptop. You don't, you don't get a camera or a trip to Fiji. You, you get a laptop. If, if I give you a camera peg, what do you get? A camera. Isn't that how it, it works? Emma, what will you get for Christmas? I can answer your question. What they give you. <laughs> Whoever they is. It could be grandma. It could be the neighbors. It could be your parents, right? It's, it, that's what you get. How many of them, that's how gifts work? You, your kids don't, I mean, they, they, your kids can come up and say, well, I want this or I want that, but they get what you give them. And the reason I point that out is I think we tend to look at God and his giftings, and I'm still talking about going and doing and being active. I think we look at God and his giftings and we say, hey, wait a second, I just get what God gives me. That's all I get. So, man, you know, I got chair stacking. That's my gift. I'm a chair stacker. That's what I do. And so that's all I have to worry about. And yet this Sentence come in, earnestly desire the best gifts. How many of you know that that means God expects you to grow, to want to grow? When you look around the first time and say, this is my gift, I, I, I'm a great administrator. I, I can be a giver. I got two or three things nailed down. God says, keep pushing. It's not a done deal. 
keep pushing, keep growing up. I have given you a task to go, and I desperately, dearly want to pour into you everything required to do it right, right up to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. I'm not holding back anything from you, nothing from you. But you have to decide that you want it. And you have to believe that I really gave it to you. And just like I mentioned when I said Thomas or, or James, you have to someday say, okay, God, it's time to use it. It's time to pray for that sick person. It's time to step out with that evangelistic gift. It's time to give when I don't think I got it to whomever you're asking me to give it to. It's time for me to believe that the power of God is given to me. Instead of just, again, passively waiting to see what God will do. It's time to move forward. Once we begin to move rather than sit, you kind of got to keep on going. Have you ever prayed for something you don't have an answer yet? What does that mean you do? Keep praying. If God tells you to stop, well, do it. But how many times are we moving forward and God doesn't tell us to stop and we stop anyway? Because we're worried about the next thing. I might not be able to do the next thing. If we really believe that Jesus commanded the church to go and to do, I pray that we will. And that we'll not only use our talents, but we'll seek everything that God the Holy Spirit has for us. Everything. The growth that God commands us to do is meant to go a long way, farther than a lot of churches ever try to take it. How far? We can see in Scripture amazing displays of the power of Jesus Christ. Again, have you restored anybody's sight lately? I had somebody ask me a while ago, and I don't remember who it is, and forgive me if you, hey, wait a second, you're dealing with my conversation. I, I, somebody was talking, asking me what ophthalmologist I went to, because I, I, mean, I, have, I have had bl high blood pressure, and it's caused some damage to my eyes over time. And so, yes, I have at times gone to an ophthalmologist, so I, I gave them an answer. Why didn't I say something like, silver and gold and ophthalmologist, have I none? <laughs> but such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and see. Can I paraphrase like that? If I don't do that to you, I'm not asking you to sign up and say I'm bad or I'm good. That's, that's not it at all. I'm just saying it doesn't really cross our minds, does it? You go to the doctor, you get the check, you get the help, you go to the counselor. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's not sinful to do that, not at all. But if I live empowered by the Holy Spirit, do I act that way? Do you act that way? Shouldn't we act? Shouldn't that be our first stop along the way? I mean, I, I don't know, if, if I don't pray, if I, if I don't get it right, if I don't take the risk, if something's wrong and I tell you it can happen and it doesn't, well, you're still free to run to the doctor or get the check or go to the counselor. Go for it. I mean, I'm not stopping that. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell if you do it. But why don't we start with God first? Huh. I love the story of the power of God that's shown. We're almost done. In John chapter 14, 12 and 13. John chapter 14, 12, and 13. Here's Jesus who has cured the crippled, healed the sick, literally interrupted funerals, broken the bondage of people, and not once. I mean, I realize that you could read the Gospels and think, well, this is just the same story over and over. And yes, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, deal with things in approximately the same order. So if you read something in Matthew and you read something in Mark, they may be referring to the same thing. However, if you go across all of the Gospels and into John, you find out that Jesus does a lot of things over and over again. The end of John it's a bit of hyperbole, but I love it. And if you tried to write down everything that he had done or said, all the books and all the world would not contain it. 
Jesus did a lot in three years of ministry. A whole lot of miracles, a whole lot of power. And yet this is what he says in John 14, 12, and 13. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. The works that I do, he will do also. If the verse stopped right there, that would be pretty incredible. I have not done those works. Have you? So there's something there. Either I'm not following the way I need to, and you're not following the way you need to, or Jesus lied. Wrap your head around that. Which is it? Notice I'm right on the same page with you. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I've got it and you don't. I'm, I'm on the same page. The works that I do, he will do also. And then it goes on. And greater works than these he will do. Now, I've heard of hyperbole, but that doesn't even make any sense. You know, hyperbole is something that's stretched to make a point. Like saying the Lions are the best professional football team to ever play. <laughs> I don't know what that, I don't even know what fits in that bit of hyperbole, but whatever. Faith. That's right, a stretch of faith. But I mean, think about this for a second. Jesus is saying, the source of truth is saying, not only will you do what I do, you will do bigger things than I will do. Why? Because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. You're not doing it on your power. You're not doing it on your strength. I get it. You're doing it in His strength and His authority. But you and I had better be doing it. Because He called us and sent us to do it. You know what happened in church history? Most of Europe and parts of the Middle East and North Africa kind of became largely Christian. And the miracles started to wane. Leaders got worried that, you know, if the power of God flowed in simple people, the loyalty might leave them. And people might start following new teachers and new preachers and new prayers. And that became an uncomfortable thing. So the teaching started to squash that. We stopped talking about what God could do. And the church lost out on the greatest motivator, one of the most exciting parts of a life of faith. Now, it never lost it entirely. How many of you know the study of church history will show you that miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit continued to go on for hundreds and hundreds of years? And after about the year four or 500, it kind of got shoved into dark corners. I don't mean dark as in bad, sinful, just that people didn't know about them very much. And it got shoved into this group and that group, and it continued. It never died. It just wasn't on the front burner. The fact that they begin to consider these people abnormal shows how far the church fell in that time. One last passage. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Matthew 16, 18 and 19 says... And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, this is where we get confused. And I know you've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If you've ever heard that these words are spoken to Peter, and Peter is the binder and the looser, and Peter is the rock on which you build the church, you heard that from somebody that's Catholic. And I'm not being hateful. I'm not picking on Catholics. There are brothers and sisters in Christ when they know Jesus Christ. How many of you know you can be Catholic and not saved, just like you can be in Assemblies of God and not saved? You can be Baptist and not saved, right? You can go to a church and, and identify with a religion and not understand and not follow the God who's the one who gave that. All right. But this verse does not say that Peter is the rock. But wait a second, Petros, rock, that's Greek. That's not, well, you have to go back to the context. What was the rock? Peter professes that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the rock upon which the church will be built. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. I always find it funny. The Christians who want to sit and wait are almost imaging the gates of hell charging at you. How many of you know that especially in context, gates don't move? 
You don't put gates on wheels. Ah, I'm chasing you with the gates. That's not how it works. The gates are a fixed fortification, the weakness in the wall. And basically what we're told is when you go, called to go, called to move, empowered by God, it doesn't matter what deception, it doesn't matter what sickness, it doesn't matter what demonic possession is out there, the power of God smashes through that. The gates of hell cannot stop you. Not Peter, not the church corporate organizationally, they cannot stop you. And so then, who is the binder and the looser? You! What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be... How many of you realize that that is not sitting and waiting to see what Jesus will do tomorrow? That is calling the power of God. What does that say in Hebrews? Calling those things that are not as though they are. Yeah. This is not theology. Christianity is not an idea. It's not a check the box and say I agree with. It's understanding that God's power is really invested in us. And we're not only to carry the word out, we're to there's so many ways to go, and I understand that. Rick does a brilliant job of, of going out and, and, and taking a small group of people. And, you know, and this, at this point, that's kind of what it is, but, but a small group of people who are not afraid to hand out a track and say, hey, have you thought about, can I pray with? And probably a lot more of us should do that. But how many of you know that, that you may not go out on a Friday night with a track, but you live in a real world that's got a lot of lost, broken people in it? And whether or not you're ever brave enough to hit the streets of Howell or Brighton or whatever and talk to somebody, you and I need to be brave enough to go to our work, to go through our neighborhood, to go to our kids' schools, to be involved in area clubs and organizations, and to share the God that empowers us. And imagine if you go into the grocery store and somebody's sick and you say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And that goes away. I think you'll get somebody to listen. If you and I want to wait till our arguments are better polished, we'll wait till we're dead. If we start asking God to manifest his power and ability, and he does, and I believe he will, you will have an audience paying attention to you. Not only the person that you prayed for, but people who saw what happened. What I want today is to give a challenge to myself as well as everybody else. Again, this isn't me preaching on high. No. We're all in this together. We've talked about the fact several weeks ago that we have something to do with the unlocking of God's power, that our faith has something to do. I've said, it may, God does 99.999% of it, but we have to show up. We're the people that have to believe that he actually will do that in us and through us. We have to start focusing ourselves so that our unbelief is overwritten and trumped by belief in what God will do. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. If I don't even think to ask him for it, do I believe or not? That's a good question. Hope we get it answered. I want to wind up by letting you know that walking in God's power is not for elites or oddities or heretics. It was his plan all along. God can see that even as Pentecostal church, a lot, churches, a lot of his churches are running at what I'm going to say is less than full throttle. Can I be honest with you? We started great and we should end great. You're hard working. You guys are amazing. You're amazing. Whether it's showing up moving people, whether it's taking mission trips to the other side of the planet, whether it's praying for folks, whether it's giving to missionaries. You guys are, are amazing. You're, I'm not saying that because, you know, you gave me a nice card and you know, I feel good. I, I'm saying you are. You're amazing human beings, personally as well as corporately. Thank you. And there's a lot that you can do in your strength, and you are. 
But how many of you know God never expected you to do it in your strength? If you're doing it in your strength, you're running at less than full throttle. And sometimes the world out there, as they're blasting at warp 10, is saying, we can do it. Human strength is just human strength. But if we start moving in the power of God, nothing can get in the way of that. Watch out, gates of hell. Here we come. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? How many of you this morning would say, I want to live with the power of God? I want to live with the power of God. I don't have to understand it all. I don't have to understand how all the theology works or what it's all going to look like or how I'm going to feel when it happens. But I'm going to live and say, I want to live with the power of God. Okay. Okay. God sees that. Now, how many of you know that at some point you're going to have to believe? I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to study the word. Why? Because the word reminds God? No. Because the word helps you deal with unbelief. The word helps you. Where faith comes by Hearing. So you get into the Word so that your faith can be stimulated and strengthened. Get into the Word so you can see what God can do. That is an important first step, and I really encourage you to do it. But when you go out there, would you start listening? And I'll start listening. And when God says, go pray for that person, can we do it? When God says, go talk to that person, can we do it? Whether it's in church or out of church or any place else. Here's a thought. Whether you're particularly personally scared of COVID or not, we live in a world where a lot of people are. How many of you know Jesus is not intimidated by COVID? Not at all. He can handle that. That doesn't mean you should wear a mask or shouldn't wear a mask or like the governor or don't like that. has nothing to do with any of it. So let's just not even go there. What it means is that Jesus is not sitting back going, oh my gosh, COVID, I don't know what to do. He's empowered you and I. Lord Jesus, you see our hearts. Lord, none of us, very, very much including this guy up here, none of us are a power unto ourselves. None of us. And yet, Lord Jesus, Luke 9, 1 and 2 is not just for the first 12. You've empowered us. You have sent us out to get a job done, and you have given us the power. Now, Lord Jesus, sometimes our faith has to attach to that. Lord, we haven't thought of it that way. Maybe we've largely been thinking about whether we're holy enough and whether we understand enough and, you know, and how that all works and whether it's going to blow up in our face. Maybe all of those things can come and tap on our shoulders. I have been there. I have felt that. I understand. I'm not being remotely judgmental. That's life. But God, you never called me to go in my own strength. You never called us to go in our own strength. You gave us the power. You gave us the power to go out and to see healings happen. You gave us the power, as crazy as it sounds, for the dead to be healed and restored. God, I don't know what that exactly looks like in the life of everybody. But Lord, I don't believe it was ever your intention to only give that to a few you didn't give it to two disciples and tell the other ten to follow them you empowered them all God I ask you this morning especially for those of us who raised their hand oh Lord Jesus stretch our faith to the point where we make the jump and we connect to that stretch our faith to the point where we start to expect not because of who we are, but because of who you are. We become to expect you to show up when there's an illness, when there's a demonic situation, when something's happened and truth needs to shine. God, I pray that we'll do that. Lord, I'm going to end in this way. Whether people come up to this altar or whether they stay in their seats, Lord Jesus, either way, it doesn't matter. Lord Jesus, I'm I'm just going to say, you can begin to speak to us in the situations we are in. So Lord Jesus, what are you empowering us to do today? What gifts have you already given us today? 
and how are we using them? What do you want us to desire next? God, don't let us simply wait and sit and wonder. We ask this in your precious name. Let the worship team play. But while they do that, let's just ask God to begin flooding into our hearts and minds and show us what he's asked us to do. Pastor John, can I just share a testimony? So I was at work on Friday, and um, I work with, I don't think there's anybody that's safe at my work. Um, And I was getting ready for my day, and my boss came up to me, and he was in tears and told me how much he appreciated me and and that he um, felt that we should lead in prayer um, at our morning meeting. So I was like, awesome. So we're at our morning meeting, we get done, and he looks at me and he says, lead us in prayer. (laughs) So, and I had a girl say, hey, can you pray for my sister-in-law? She's got cancer. And um, I'm I'm petrified right now, but (laughs) um, to do that in front of unbelievers, I was like, sure, I'll do that. And um, it was just awesome. I was like, you know, God, you're bigger than cancer. You're bigger than... And it was just awesome because when we got done, they all were in awe. And they said, you've done that before. And um, I think it blessed them because some of them were almost in tears. And so I just pray that it continues, that he comes to me again. And I pray that it becomes a thing. And so. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. That's somebody doing exactly what God's telling them to do, walking in his power. Thank you, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see. And sing with me. Open. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's do that again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Lord, I want to see you. 
everybody sing open. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Please, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high. To see you high and lifted up, oh, and shining in the light of your glory, Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. time. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see that I'm sending you out and saying you got to go do a bunch of miracles because like I, you and I can't, right? How many of you know this is not an obligation to go and drag ourselves through anything? This is just connect our hearts and our faith to the one who gets it done and watch it get done through you. And what possibly could be bad about that? Amen? Go get it done. God bless you. Thank you for who you are and what you do. Let people see Jesus in you every single day. Better is one day in your courts.